So in this next section, I want to talk about um, U.S. safety nets and government aid. But, but first, I want to reiterate who are these um, people that we're talking about. About 51 million people, or 17% of Americans, lived on less than 125% of the federal, federal poverty level in 2007. Um, people at greatest risk um, for this food insecurity and this level of poverty were generally headed by households he headed by a single woman. Um, she was Hispanic or black with incomes below the poverty line. Or households with children. Um, typically a household with children experiences food insecurity at almost double the rate um, for a household without children. And you can imagine um, why that is. Because if you add a child into a situation, um, you're having to feed the child, obviously, um, but that child isn't able to provide any sort of income or any sort of provision for themselves. Um, so you're placing dependence in a situation that's already strained. Um, and the more dependence you have in that situation, the more strain it's going to be on the household. And again, typically, um, you know, we're talking about single moms. We're talking about um, people with, with multiple children. Um, and geographically, these, these, this food insecurity is more common in a, a central city household, so more common in urban centers. Um, and these households are, are more likely to be hungry or food insecure if they live in states in the Midwest or the South. Um, so if you remember back to the poverty map that I showed you, um, this is actually the map that goes county by county in the United States and shows um, where the, the the most vulnerable populations live. Um, the, the brighter the color is the, indicates a higher percentage of, a, of the population living in these um, poverty, impoverished situations. Um, again, pointing out the Midwest and the South. Um, as a part of this course, th there's going to be a, a case study that we do on the Black Belt in particular, which is that string of of states along the South and in through Texas. Um, and it's the region of the United States that historically um, was where cotton was grown and where the cotton plantations were. And it was named the Black Belt because of the, the quality of the soil and the color of the soil. Um, but over time, um, post-Civil War and, and over the, the last 200, 150, 200 years of our history, um, that has become the most impoverished region of our country. Um, switching topics, I want to talk a little bit about government safety nets and government aid that exist that help these populations. Um, when someone qualifies for a safety net, um, this means that they are income eligible um, for these nutri for nutri federal nutrition programs, things like food stamps, um, WIC, SNAP, um, I'll go into those in just a minute, um, and other nutritional programs. Um, these programs can help families and children to stretch their food dollars and also give them access to healthier foods. Um, what I mean by stretch their food dollars is, is they're a supplemental program. So most of these programs aren't meant to be the sole source of your food, um, but they provide food at intervals. Um, as I said, like a food bank, you can go four times per year. Um, and that's meant to be supplementing the food that you're buying for yourself. So if you can go to a food bank, the food that you can get there means that you're not going to spend that chunk of money on the food that you're able to get for free. Um, when we talk about safety net programs here in the U.S., um, we have many, many programs, but the main ones are the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Programs, um, Women, Infant, and Children um, Program, which is called WIC. Um, this essentially was set up so that, that pregnant women and nursing mothers um, and young children can have access to things like um, whole milk and, and eggs and dairy products, which provide essential nutrients during this key development phase. Um, if you remember, Professor Coots said that the first thousand days of a child's life is, is some of the key pivotal days of brain development. And if a child is nutritionally deficient during those days, then you set they're, they're being set up for their entire life to live in a state that's less than the capacity they could have achieved if they had had adequate nutrition provided to them. Um, other federal programs, I mentioned the food stamp program. It's, it's officially referred to as SNAP, which means the federal food stamp program. Um, there's, there's a few other federal programs, and then each state tends to have their own um, nutritional program. 
Um, when we talk about these programs in the United States, um, there's a lot of discrepancies between who's eligible to participate in these programs and who actually participates in these programs. Um, for example, in 2006, um, 38 million people were eligible to participate in the food stamp program, but only about 65% actually did. Um, the, these numbers have increased um, over time. For example, in 2001, only 16% of eligible families participated. Um, and that's mainly because of extension and outreach. Um, a lot of families that qualify for these programs um, are, are actually unaware that they even qualify. Um, and they may not have the, the education um, that they need to fill out the right forms. Um, it's a very complicated process to actually go from recognizing your need for food stamps to actually getting the food stamps. Um, and there are organizations set up that help people actually apply for the paperwork. In 2007, an average of 26.5 million people used the food stamp program in the United States each month. Um, so you can see it's a valuable program that, that the American population is using, um, but again, with only 65% of people that qualify for food stamps actually participating in the program, um, there is a tremendous room for growth and a tremendous need to expand these programs. Um, in the next section, Professor Kutz is going to come back and talk to you about um, programs that exist on an international level so that you can compare these domestic programs to the global programs um, and we can begin to paint the picture of the differences between um, global and domestic hunger.